Hi, I'm Ben from InterNACHI, and I'm here with Dave Kraus from Influential Drones, and they provide drone training for InterNACHI members all over the country. So if you're an InterNACHI member and you're thinking about doing drones, stop. Get trained and certified, or maybe it's licensed. You'll have to get licensed, yes. And it's regulated. You can't just buy one of these drones that you're holding in your hand off of Amazon and start flying it around. Not unless you're trying to get in trouble. No, you can't. So what are we going to do in this training video coming up? Well, some of the things we're going to do in the video is we're right here at the House of Horrors. We're going to take this drone. We're going to fly it around really? inside this area. Yeah. And then we're also going to meet up with an international member, cool. have some conversations with him. And later on, we're going to take his drone and our drone off site and show this thing in real world practice. At a real house. A real house out here in Boulder. And you're uh, certified or licensed to do that? I'm licensed to do that. We've already notified the police. Yeah. We've done all the community notification properly. Yeah. Everything is legal, we're ready to go. So if I'm, I am an international member, I'm a certified professional inspector, and I want to get into drones. What do I do? do I, should I contact you? Should I go online? Does FAA have some information? So the FAA does have a regular information website. Yeah. It would be FAA Drone Zone. Yeah. You can get some information on there or just go to FAA.gov. You could also call our office, which is 856-281-7545, influentialdrones.com. Yep. Or visit this website at natchez.org, Influential Drones. So if you're an international member, be careful. Just don't buy a drone and start flying it around for your commercial purposes. It's a regulated thing. So get trained and certified, and I'm here with Dave Krause, Influential Drones, and we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna show you guys how to fly safely. Nice. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. My name is Dave Krause, Influential Drones. Today I'm here at InterNACHI headquarters in Boulder, Colorado. Behind me is the House of Horrors, and beside me is Evan Elliott. Evan owns Elliott Home Inspections, Inc., and the reason why we're sitting together is to talk about drones. As I understand it, you have a drone in your, uh, for your business. Can you tell me about it? Yes, I can. I have a unique Typhoon H+. It's a hexacopter, means it has six props, six motors. It has good camera capabilities, but it does not have infrared slash thermal imaging. So in my hands, I'm holding a Mavic Enterprise Dual. This is a quadcopter. The reason why I chose to bring this one today is because it has thermal capabilities. There are two lenses on this camera, RGB and thermal. There are other brands out there that make portable drones that have the same accessories. However, this is the one we chose to bring today. Today we're gonna to talk about the benefits of drones with thermal image capabilities for home inspectors and the home inspecting industry. So let's get right to it. Okay, Dave, sounds good. So talk about a little bit the process that you go through before you launch the drone. Obviously we take it out of the box, we set it up, but let's, let's start from your, your landing gear, your, your landing zone standpoint. How do you set up your landing zone to make sure that the community knows that you're operating safely and that you're about to perform a drone operation? Well, as a home inspector, I pull up with my pickup truck that says Elliott Home Inspections on it. I put a cone on either end of the vehicle where I'm parked. Then I put in a landing area that's a bright orange circular pad that's weighted on the perimeter for where I will take off and land my drone. Then I additionally put cones in proximity to that at a reasonable distance to more or less claim my space right. and deter others from entering. And then you obviously you talk to the property owners and make sure that you have consent to fly. Yes. And when you do a general flight operation, some of the things we're taking in consideration that we're using the drone for would be what? Um, my thoughts are uh, rooftops, gutters, skylights, chimneys, maybe if we did, um, if we're looking at a second story structure, do you look at the windows and the sidings from another elevation? I can. It depends, okay. you know, in some cases it's prohibitive because they'll have uh, trees, mature landscaping, others okay. no problem, want to avoid running into trees and things like that, but yes, it's good for anything that's high up, fascias around the perimeter in particular, get those corners where water typically gets in from a failing gutter. It's one of the first places that is a problem on the fascia. So now what about obviously um, the tops of roofs? I mean, there are certain shingles that we can't walk on for safety purposes and even just the pitches in a roof. Yes. Talk to me about how a drone helps you in that area. I would imagine it saves some time as well. 
drone does save time. It's a lot of work and time to safely set up ladders, take them off the truck, put them back on the truck, and position them safely, which is often, uh, again, prohibitive depending on the landscaping around you uh, and the conditions. The advantages of the drone are primarily safety and efficiency. Again, back to the ladder. So it's less time to use a, a drone rather than setting up ladders. It's safer than actually physically mounting the roof. That right. means climbing up on the roof and walking the roof. Low pitch roofs, 6, 12 or less, they aren't very dangerous. It's still a roof though. Exactly. Now we're, you asked about the materials. Metal roofs, high end, uh, slate roofs, shake shingle roofs can be very uh, conducive to mold and they're very slippery. Um, and they were, they're fragile too, they can break. A lot of roofing materials shouldn't be walked on directly. Even your 80-90% of roofs that are asphalt shingles, they get too hot in the summer and you can damage them by walking on them. Right. And they get too cold in the winter because they also they become brittle then. We also have copper roofs as well. Correct. And then obviously when you're looking at a different um, level house, sometimes you have you know a first story roof that will um, tie into a second story roof and now it's unsafe to actually put a ladder between the stories. It's tempting but you don't have to have that temptation with a drone. And I would imagine the same holds true also when we were talking earlier about looking down and checking gutters. Instead of hanging over the edge or moving a ladder from place to place, the drone could just hover in place and, and, and take a look at things for you. It's a beautiful thing, Dave. I take that drone and I can cover all those gutters lickety split. I mean, awesome. really quick. You can see right in there. You can tell immediately if they're clean or cluttered up with leaves. And you can tell also that they're just coated with gravel from your asphalt roof, which is an indicator of the age of the roof because the gravel fills in a gutter and you can know that you have an older roof or a newer roof. And back to, gee, these need to be hosed out by a professional gutter cleaning person. That's pretty interesting that you mentioned that because I know in my own house, um, when I cleaned my gutters, I, I saw that sediment in there and I had not known that, so it, it, it's interesting. Yeah, the more gravel in there, the more indication of either a lot of stress on the roof, usually it's just things working loose from general snow and water erosion. Uh, if it was from hail, you'd know it because you pretty much that. you're going to be looking for a new roof if you're seeing those dents and dings from large hail anyway. So have you had a chance to take a look at a thermal camera and see what the capabilities of that are? A thermal camera on a drone? Yes. I have not myself used that. So I do use infrared thermal imaging around homes, but that's a different device that attaches to, uh, it's handheld rather than on my drone. Talk to me about the value of that from the ground. Obviously it's something that, you know, you have a different vantage point but um, as a home inspector, that thermal's gotta be invaluable for certain things. It is, and it does help me find those thermal anomalies that lead me to further investigation, which is moisture, additional temperature checks, get out the moisture meters, and do comparisons in comparable areas to determine that indeed this is an anomaly of high moisture content. The drone with a infrared thermal imaging would be an advantage. So some of the things that a thermal drone brings to the table is we can obviously look behind stucco, we can look behind siding, we can see if there's water damage. We can do the same, we're looking at rooftop shingles. However, of course, depending on what the rooftop material is made of, we are not gonna be able to, in, most, in some cases, penetrate. Right. Um, you're also gonna have some situations with the drone where you're able to find hot spots or heat loss spots, which would be a direct result of a problem with insulation. Yes. Sometimes that also indicates that there's an open area on the structure where critters can get into the house. So we have in the past used drones with a thermal imager and we can see a bee swarm inside the walls of the house from the exterior. Yep. Um, obviously that doesn't work with a brick house, but it does obviously with a wood one. Well, I'll tell you what, how about we take a, long, uh, we take a walk through the House of Horrors and you show me some things about it and we see what we can apply using a drone. So Evan, as we get out here on the balcony, how about we imagine a drone being out here in the space over here, and as it's looking down on the rooftop, let's talk about the advantages a drone can offer. Well, there are a lot of advantages. I, if I was going to use the drone here to try and look at the pro potential problems, I would first come in maybe from this, put the drone in this position over here, and then I could see the fascia, I could see the drip edge, 
I could see the rooftop. I could check that the flashing is laying above roofing materials as it should be. I could look at my favorite trouble spot, which is where the gutter ends here at the corner of the soffits, or rather the fascia. And then I would change positions and come over this way. And then I could get an angle on this, this roof section. Again, the corners, the drip edge, the overhang of the roofing materials, all the usual suspects when one's taking a look at, at a roofing uh, structure to okay. determine if there's any potential issues. And then again, if we had thermal imaging, we would be able to see the water damage that is below the yes, we uh, shingles. We would also be able to see heat loss if, let's say, insulation was to sag lower down into the wall. We can see the difference in temperature at the top. We can see other things as far as water damage, and that would be all. Yeah. So how about we take a look at some, another area over here at the House of Horrors? Okay. Got to love that thermal imaging. Check out all those temperature, an temperature anomalies and then yeah, we can follow up on it. So now we're looking down on the roof in the area that we were just standing upon. I can see a little bit more the siding and whatnot and I actually think this would be a great use for a drone. It would be. Let's take a look at another location. Another place to look is those valleys. Valleys are often a fail point if they aren't properly installed and the thermal imaging can be a great help with that especially if it's been moist lately. So here's another uh, exposed roof that we're taking a look at. Obviously, the thermal imager will be able to see under this paper. We'll be able to see other things that are going on. If there were shingles, the drone could see what is happening underneath. I like that, it could, that we're looking at the gutters as well. Yeah, and this gravel that's here, we could pick that up with our drone. You could actually see the temperature differential. Yes, you can. That will gravel. hold a lot more heat than this reflective white gray painted interior lining on this gutter, for example. So that's another great thing to point out is when you start using a thermal imager, for example, if we had a downspout that was clogged and the water was congested in this area here, the drone would see the clog source oh, yeah. and we'd be able to identify it. We'd also be able to potentially clear the passageway. Yes. Let's take a look over here at some of the shingles. So now looking at some of these shingles right here, I'm sorry, I can't describe all of them, but I would imagine a lot of these is not good to walk on. Yep, these are a fairly resilient composite material, but they're potentially slippery. Okay. And again, this is a more less, well, a very resistant one. It's the shake shingles, that cedar shingles that I'm reluctant to walk on. They have a high slip rate. They can also be loose from their attachment points because they are prone to splitting where they're nailed in. A guy thinks he's got good footing and the whole shingle moves, oh, even wow. though the surface isn't covered with any kind of mold, algae, or moss. So what are we looking at here? This this looks like some sort of, uh, is it a is it a terracotta? It's, I think this is a cementious material, okay. meaning a cast kind of formed cement extruded and pressed into shape. These are fragile. You can hear, hear that ring? It's like, just think of crockware. And if you walk on these, again, you can potentially crack and loosen and they can slip. And okay. if they're at a steep angle, even if they were safe to walk on, you wouldn't want to be walking on that. Especially if it would be wet, too, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, very slippery. slippery. And so a drone keeps you from damaging the roof, hurting yourself, etc. So tell me about this one over here. What are we looking at? Again, another cementious tile. This is a interlocking tile rather than your more traditional southwestern look. The surface looks very smooth, I would imagine. It's slippery it as well. It is smooth and slippery and prone to cracking under uh, on focused weight. The professional roofers, they'll span these types of areas with materials that are designed to be walked on. Okay. So basically they'll put out a trellis, uh, like a ladder structure or uh, supportive, not quite scaffolding, but they will suspend their weight across. To spread the load. That's right. All right, and this looks like another, some sort of terracotta. These are closer to your traditional terracotta clay. They don't look like they're obviously this is as, as wide as the other one we looked at, so I would imagine it's a little bit more vulnerable to breaking. This is a fired clay and it is fragile under load of like a human foot. Right. A lot of pounds per square inch every step we take. This is one of my favorites. This is obviously slate. This is, I, I know this from my own experience, you need to be careful walking on this and it can get quite slippery. Yes, so it this can. is another great example of the use of a drone. And slate is fragile and it is slippery and a drone is perfect for handling a roof, rooftop inspection that is slate. So one of the things we didn't see as far as surfaces, but what I am noticing here as from the undercoat is copper. Sometimes copper is used for the surfaces of roofs. 
and that is also something that's dangerous to walk on. So that's the slate. Let's see what else we can find over here. Okay. Oh, I know this one. Here you have a classic asphalt shingle. It's got slight architectural details to it. It's not absolutely a standard three tab. This is what we most commonly see though as a basic material is this asphalt felted. And uh, we can use thermal imaging on this also to determine again the heat loss from poor insulation and the moisture that would be in areas that are leaking and moisture gets back in there and holds in that wood and that should show up in your thermal imaging. So obviously this is one of the more common rooftop surfaces but talk to me also about pitch. As I understand it, the steeper the pitch, the harder it is to walk on. Yes. This would be a great example or use of a drone. Exactly, it would. Uh, once you have a pitch that's more than 6, 12, I won't walk it. Right. And if it's high, I won't walk it. Not that I'm afraid of the height once I'm on a lower roof. It's getting up there. If it doesn't have a roof hatch, I'm going up ladders. And ladders are a very dangerous thing. It's one of the most common areas of uh, incidents where home inspectors are hurt. So let's take a look at some of the other places around this house. I see right here we got some skylights. Yes, we do. Obviously skylights, similar to even solar panels, is something that you, you need to be careful of when you're around. It's a vulnerability in the roof, so there would be some potential for water getting in. A, therm a thermal image could help identify that. And likewise, we could do an inspection, heat loss, and other problems with the unit itself. I'm thinking this is either a bathroom vent or it could be a a kitchen vent, I don't recall what is below it. That uh, I do know as a vent stack. Obviously the drone can take a look at that, can see things around it, and you can identify stuff. All the roof penetrations are prime suspects for water issues, moisture problems, and failures that will occur in time depending on the installation, if it was done properly in the first place or not. So I guess the last question I have for you is, do you include drone photos in your final report to your customer? And how do you feel that that adds value to your business? Well, I do include drone photos of rooftops and all the penetrations, be they vents, even the uh, skylights, which is essentially a large penetration through the roof barrier that is to keep moisture out. Um, I always include all those photos in my reports. And of course, it's benefiting me as a home inspector because that's the service they've hide, hired me for. Right. I would imagine it's a, good, it's a great competitive advantage for you. It is. Evan, I appreciate you taking the time to show me the house of horrors over here. Oh, it's my pleasure. So how about we go on site and we talk about the use of drones? Okay. Hello, this is Dave Krause, Influential Drones. I'm here with Evan Elliott from Elliott Home Inspections, Inc. We are out here in front of this house with a Typhoon H drone and we've already notified police and local law enforcement that we're going to be doing a flight operation. Right now we're going to go fly this drone. Here we go. So let me just tell you real quickly about this drone. After he starts it up, what's going to happen is all six props are going to start spinning. The unique six prop drone is very unique because if one of the props actually fails, the drone is still going to stay airborne. Whereas a quadcopter, which has four, four propellers, in the event, that one of the propellers or the motors fails, the drone is coming out of the sky. So whenever you're dealing with uh, a drone that has more than four props, it's a lot more reliable and it's a lot more stable in higher winds. The other thing that's good about this unique drone is that it has retractable landing gear. So it'll give you uninterrupted access or views to what the drone is seeing. Yeah, the, legs, the landing gear doesn't get in the view of the camera that way when the landing gear is retracted. All right, Evan, let's start this drone up. Okay, here we go. Now we're just gonna hold so it gonna... there at about six feet and see if it stays there. Stay. And got our left, come up a tad again. So you're gonna check your forward and backward movement. Mm -hmm, that's back. And we have forward. I also want you to yaw side to side to make sure that your controls and your stability is proper. Let's do a 360 of the drone. How does that feel to you? You feel like you have good control? Oh yeah. 
Okay, let's attract the landing gear and head on up. There we go. And we have video. So a lot of the times when you do inspections, what we recommend is starting at a certain corner and working your way around the house. Mm -hmm. Whether you go in a clockwise movement or a counterclockwise movement is really up to your personal preference. As long as you cover, you get full coverage of the property. Bring our camera view down a little bit. Let's see. Is my gimbal stuck? Uh, camera problem. All right, so what's the problem that we have here? Yeah, let's see, we're not getting our camera to pan up and down. I'm gonna bring it down and see what that is. Okay, so in this situation, because the drone is not operating properly, we're gonna bring it down, take a quick look at it. Safety is always important. So let's take a moment here and test your skill, see if you can land on the H. Oh yeah. Now right now we don't have a lot of wind, so the landing, the landing pad is actually staying in a good position. If there was a higher wind, you'd have to be a little bit more cautious when you fly. It's best to obviously stake that down. This one actually has a heavy cable going all the way around it. Now, what is wrong with that camera? So what happened was we actually had a door that was open in the back of the drone, which gives us access to the memory card. And as a result of that door being open, the drone was unable to pan the camera down. This is a great example and a reason why we always pre-check the drone and we make sure that drone is always safe to fly. Standard things that you do prior to flight is obviously you secure the propellers, make sure your arms are in place, make sure the camera is stable, and obviously the landing gear is secure. It was a minor oversight that the memory door was open. However, now that we have corrected the problem, we're ready to launch again. Okay, here we go. We're starting the drone up, and under normal circumstances, we're actually gonna check our positioning again before we go up on higher elevation. It's always good to check if the drone is operating properly before we take it high in the air. And the reason being is quite simple. If the drone has a problem, it's only gonna fall four feet. There's not gonna be any injuries or damages to property. If the drone was a higher distance in the air and it, it fell out of the sky, obviously then we would have property damage. Let's take it on up. Okay, just put that where we want. Check our camera, camera's doing what it should do. I habitually lift the landing gear as I go up. So now some of the drones, depending on model, will automatically retract and lower their landing gear as you're flying. Yeah, we come down here if we were gonna take, be taking pictures of this. And I change my position to keep my reference to the building. Okay. I notice you always stand facing the rear of the drone. That's a good habit to get into. Helps with orientation. And then if we were doing a shoot of this, well, we would adjust our camera accordingly and take captures as we paused intermittently on the roof for specific areas. Like so we, we might get to that stack there. We'd turn to the right a little, bring it into the view. There it is. Maybe get a little closer and take a picture of those areas. And then we would come down in on that and remember, when we get back home to the office, we can enlarge these images and see even more detail than we're seeing right now on a sunny day on this screen. So now, do you get into the habit of taking pictures or do you always constantly record video? I primarily take stills. Okay. Videos are kind of for fun or complimentary to stick in the report. Taking a look at this house right now, we've already started with the corner. We've glanced at the gutters mm -hmm. and now we looked at the vent stack over there. What else do you think we should take a look at? Now let's take a look at the ridge here. Now when you're looking at the ridge with the drone, mm -hmm. what in particular are you looking for? Looking for damage to the shingles, that they're not curling up, that they're not improperly nailed. Sometimes you'll see that they're nailed and they're caulked. I'd tell the customer that, or the would-be buyer that they need to be aware of those areas as potential leaking later because caulk will shrink and crack. So now if we had a thermal imager, which we will launch the other drone and actually take a look, mm -hmm. the thermal imager will actually see if there's water damage underneath the roof shingles. Yes. It would also see it behind stucco and behind siding. The other benefit of using a thermal imager when you're looking at the property is you're able to, act, you're able to see heat loss and issues with insulation. Another thing I may interject is if you have a variable power uh, option on your drone, I like to take the power down. So now if I move left or right, I don't suddenly move three or five feet by accident. I'm in a lower power mode. So for example, if I go up now with high power, wow, I go up fast. And if I take it to the lower power and go up, it, as it as ascends much slower. Same with coming down and that translates to all other maneuvers. 
Right now it's in low power. Often I go kind of middle. So it's always important when you fly the drone because as soon as you're an inch or off, off the land, you are in federal airspace. So I think it's a great habit that you're getting into of controlling your momentum and the speed of your aircraft for safety. Absolutely. It's all about safety first, everything we do in home inspection. Safety of the inspector, safety of the residents, safety of the public. And there we have a nice picture, for example, here of that corner. We could even get closer to it. You take a snapshot, gives us an idea of the condition of that area of the roof. So I'm interested in actually seeing how you would go around since we have a tree in the front. Yes. Would you wrap wide or would you go up and over and point the camera down? How do you find that it's best for you to take the picture you need? I keep in line of sight. I want to see what I'm trying to take imagery of. Okay. So in this case, I back up here more to get the rest of this house. I can still see my drone for that back roof on that garage, attached garage, confidently from here and still know I'm getting good images and right. I'm not losing sight of my drone. The other side of that house beyond the ridge, clearly that's obstructed. I would leave my drone hovering for a minute or maybe you know, reposition it closer to where I'm going, avoiding the trees. Now I have it right mid-line with the ridge on top of the house. I can watch it from where I am, go around this tree, move up the street here 50 feet, and now from where I'm standing, I can see this other side of the roof on the house and begin to confidently and safely maneuver my drone. Correct. So now if you notice, I actually stayed where I was standing because federal law requires that you always have to have your eyes on the drone. Because we are flying together, I allowed Evan to walk to a safe distance where he could actually see the drone again. And now that he has eyes on it, I'm gonna walk towards Evan. And then I would come down, back up a little, a little lower. Now I have eyes on the drone and we both have eyes together. And inspect this side of the building. And again, we have clear views of the roof, roofers tie off. We can pivot around and take a look at the, all the penetrations in the roof on this side. So right now what's happening is we have a low battery warning. Generally what you do when the battery is low is we bring it down to swap everything out. We're gonna actually land the drone, swap the battery, and put it back in the air. Drones have special safety precautions, such as low battery warnings, which help us to determine safe operations and keep the drone in the air. That's right, on this drone we get 15, 20 minutes of operation per battery per cycle. And when we get to the 30s, we get the warning to come down. The concern is that this drone will return to home on its own if I don't bring it back before the battery's dangerously low. So what, what percentage of battery are we at right now? Right now we're at 31. When I first started it, the return, it was at 38. So it goes fast. When it gets to 28 or 32, it will return itself. And I don't like that because it often, it will do line of sight to get there. It'll right. go up so high and then do a line of sight. And uh, that's a potential collision with obstructions Correct. so it's important to stay on top of that now we've landed it we turn it off and we can put a new battery and fly again for 15 20 minutes so while we have the drone on the ground we're going to real quickly swap out the battery which goes in the back of the unit and what's important to note is that they're all different brands of drones but since evan is flying this unique version we're just going to talk again about some of the safety points the propellers spin clockwise and counterclockwise direction when you put them on, you lock them in place. One of the things that I particularly like about the Unique brand is the fact that if the propeller is missing or the armature is down, the drone will recognize that. So now that we got the props back on, it looks like, and, and the drone is powered up, we're ready to take off again. Let's take a, a safe distance from the drone. And where will we fly this time? Well, what is the maximum elevation that you can take this drone in the boulder area or an airspace in general? 400 feet, okay. 399. So how about we take it to about 390 feet? We look straight down over the property. We show this drone, how, I mean, we show everyone how high this drone can fly. Okay. All right, so we're gonna start this drone, take it up to 390 feet. We know that we're in class G airspace. And we're gonna take a look straight down on the property. Are you ready to start? We're ready. Okay. 
Props are spinning. You ready? Okay. So we've confirmed removement of the drone once again. Now we're raising the legs and we're gonna take the drone up in the air. In a position where I don't have the sun so much in my eyes. And here we go. And we need to pan our camera down to see the ground. There we go. Now we can see our takeoff area and we are gonna go up to a maximum legal altitude. Right? Keeping an eye out for birds any other object in the sky that may be in our area of flight. We're at 200, 235, 268, 70, 80, 350, 365, 370, 368. Okay. So let's bring her back down. There we go. Had to get those wee gear down. There we go. Let's bring it back to the pad. So what we're gonna do right now is turn the drone off because we're out in the heat of the sun because it's got a black body, it's always gonna risk overheating. So now that the drone is turned off and we've confirmed it's off, for safety, I'm gonna pull the battery and we're gonna walk this drone into shade. Too hot, operating ceilings 104. And I guess that includes the body. So we flew the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual to show the thermal capabilities of the drone. So right now we have the drone hovering over the property and we're gonna switch over to a thermal view which will allow us to help see heat loss and other issues. Of course, it's in the middle of the day and it's pretty sunny outside, so we're not gonna get optimum results. We took the drone up to 390 feet just to get a total site survey of the land. However, in most situations, you can do that about 150 feet. One of the things we always do to conclude our operations is to reach out to local law enforcement. It's always good to get in the habit of doing that just as a courtesy and also so that they're aware of the operation. So I'm about to call the police right now. Yes, hi, this is Dave Krause, Influential Drones. How are you doing today? Not too bad. I just wanted to let you know that we've concluded the drone operation over here in Frederickstown and we are go the drones are safely stored and we're ready to put them away. No problem at all. Thank you and have a good day. Just like that, that's all you have to do. Hi, this is Dave Krause, Influential Drones. Today I'm sitting here at my office in New Jersey with my business partner, Dr. Stephen Davis. Steve is an FAA certified flight instructor and a pilot of well over 20 years. Steve, how many people have you taught over the years? A uh, number, over 100, youngest was eight, oldest, over 80, a few of them. So you saw the video of my interaction with uh, Evan Elliott over out there in Boulder, and there was a few things that I missed. Let's talk about the importance of actually working and, and getting instruction from an FAA certified flight instructor such as yourself. You were just answering questions. You went through certain examples. You took the time to talk to Evan and Ben. You were discussing the best practices for the drones and how to work around the house of horrors. Uh, you did a great job. In future videos, we'll try and address more about the best practices how to work safely and notify the public and the police so that in no time do you get in trouble. The importance of an operation is that you set up your game plan so that you know from start to finish what you have to do. You go through a systematic process. The aviation industry, the commercial aviation industry, they got a very safe record. They use something called aeronautical decision making where they go through an, a, a systematic approach so that the outcome is never in doubt. And they have some of the highest records and you must use a checklist. You must use 
they have a cockpit, we'll call it a crew resource management. So they're taught about judgment and they're taught more about attitudes than the drone pilot does. So a Part 61 manned pilot is going to educate you so that you have the best, safest practices that are tried and true in the commercial aviation industry. So I mean really the FAA has one of the best, or the aviation industry has one of the best safety records. And Steve and I are actually part of the FAA safety team. It's called the FAST team. As a matter of fact, Influential Drones is the only drone company in the United States that is an industry member with the FAA for safety team. Obviously, we, we practice safety and the importance of checklists, aeronautical decision making, and communication with the crew. So Steve, one of the things that you know happens with our business is we get two frequent phone calls. One of them in particular is, how do I get my drone license? So what are the qualifications that are needed to get that? Well, that's a good question. It's relatively easy. Anybody can get a remote pilot certification. You have to be at least 16 years old. Okay. Uh, read, write, understand the English language. The FAA has a knowledge test that you must pass, uh, and they have testing centers that are set up. Uh, we've helped numerous people. Um, we've had everyone pass. It's not all that difficult. And that's one of the things. We've had a very good success rate helping people pass and get their exam. And the other common question that we get a lot is, what's right for us? What drone should we choose? So we have here three drones, and it's just really for demonstration purposes. This one drop back here is a unique 520. It is the same drone that is similar to the Typhoon body shape wise as what Evan was using during the demonstration. There's nothing wrong with any of these drones. The primary difference is obviously in personal comfort, personal preference, and a couple features. We're not going to go through features right now as far as which drones have thermal or not, but what you're going to notice is the smaller drones are a lot more portable in size. This is a Altel Evo by Altel Robotics, and that is a Mavic 2 drone by DJI. So that concludes our video, and we thank you for watching it. Additional information can be found on the InterNACHI website or by visiting InfluentialDrones.com. We are uh, licensed pilots ourselves. We are members of the FAA FAST team. Steve is an FAA certified flight instructor. We help work with community colleges and other educational institutions to help make people fly safely. Thank you, members. Thank you, inspectors. Thank you, you InterNACHI. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dave.